My name is Ibu Patel. I'm founder and president of IFYC. Thank you to Catherine and Becca for organizing this exciting webinar. And my job right here is uh, simple and delightful. I get to introduce you to my friend and longtime mentor, the Reverend Fred Davey, who was actually uh, one of the first people I talked to about IFYC way back in 1998 or 1999 when he was at the Ford Foundation. And, uh, uh, and uh, I was just starting the organization and he was very encouraging back then. And not only have we stayed in touch for the last uh, 20 plus years, he has guided the organization and really as of today joins the organization. So I am thrilled to announce that Fred Davey is IFYC's Senior Advisor on Racial Equity and Interfaith Cooperation. And one of the initiatives that uh, he and I uh, have launched together uh, is an in initiative called Black Interfaith. And this uh, brings together a set of the uh, fellows, the working group of Black Interfaith for a reflection session on what Black Interfaith means in this particular moment in time. So welcome, Fred. I am totally thrilled you are joining us at IFYC. Thank you for serving as a board member for a decade and as a mentor and friend for much longer. And uh, this is a fitting launch to the next phase of our friendship and working relationship together. Over to you. Great. Thank you, Ibu. And uh, it's really wonderful to uh, have this new uh, iteration, if you will, in terms of relationship with, with IFYC. It's been great to, uh, to have been a board member over the years. It's been absolutely wonderful and extraordinarily beneficial to me to be uh, your friend and colleague. Um, uh, over these years. I'll just tell a quick story. 20 some odd years ago, I'm driving in a snowstorm on the New York Thruway and I'm listening to this broadcast from Ch Chautauqua and I hear this guy and I, I said, who is this young man? Uh, he's going to be extraordinarily influential very soon. And shortly after that, Ibu was uh, in my office at the Ford Foundation by mutual introduction. And as he said, that was 20 some odd years ago. And we've been on this path, uh, path since then. Uh, and, uh, and it's really been um, a pleasure and, 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 and uh, very beneficial to me to have this friendship and this relationship both with you and with IFYC. Uh, and I'm also very pleased to join um, our, our friends and colleagues here. Uh, I've known uh, everyone here in 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 some context uh, over the decades, uh, and it's it's a real pleasure to now join uh, everyone uh, as a part of the Black Interfaith Initiative uh, with uh, the Interfaith Youth Corps with IFYC, uh, and it's great to have this conversation today, uh, particularly as we consider uh, what has transpired in the year since uh, George Floyd's stuff, which we'll have more to say about. Uh, and the need for an interfaith voice in this space. Uh, so let me take a moment then uh, to introduce uh, this, this really illustrious and august uh, group who, who uh, 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 have gathered today to share, share their thoughts. Um, so we have with us uh, Alia Bilal, who serves as Deputy Director uh, at the Inner City Muslim Action Network a native of Chicago Southside. She sits on the board of the Southwest Organizing Project and was an appointee of the Equity Advisory Council of the Chicago Commission on Human Relations. We also have with us Dr. Anthea Butler, uh, Associate Professor for Religious and Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Her new book, White Evangelical Racism, the Politics of Morality in America is out as of March 2021 on Ferris and Ferris, a division of UNC Press. Reverend Adam Russell Taylor is president of Sojourners and author of Mobilizing Hope, Faith-Inspired Activism for a Post-Civil Rights Generation. His forthcoming book, A More Perfect Union, is out September 14th and Dr. Eric Williams is curator of religion, Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, and writes at the intersection of religion, history, and material religion. Co-editor of the TNT Clark Handbook of African American Theology, Dr. Williams is currently completing 
a manuscript exploring theological significations in African-American Pentecostal thought. So I wanna welcome all of you to say again, what a joy it is to join you in this conversation. I'm gonna kick things off with some questions that uh, we have talked about, and then want to just open it up and give you all to interact uh, in any way that you uh, feel moved to uh, in order to contribute to what I know is gonna be a robust and rich conversation. So as we said, we're here in a conversation over a year after George Floyd's murder, uh, among a grotesque list of, uh, of uh, people, uh, black men and women, uh, brown folks, trans people, who have been killed at alarmingly high and disproportionate rates. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King famously said that the moral arc of the universe is long but it bends toward justice. So I would ask you, each of you, uh, how do you understand this time we're living in? What we are experiencing in this unique moment? What kinds of interfaith activities or engagement have you um, been involved with uh, in this year to uh, address this issue of uh, everything from police violence to the need for fundamental social justice uh, in America? So uh, uh, to kick us off, uh, Alia, would you, Alia, would you like to, uh, to, to get us started? Sure, I'd be honored. Thank you so much, Reverend Davey, and thank you to IFYC for hosting us in this conversation. I'm, I'm, I've been really looking forward to this as, as we've been building as a, a um, you know, a, a, a committee, uh, a group of folks working on this Black Interfaith Project, I think, um, the idea of interfaith um, as, a, as a tool um, and as a tool that especially Black people uh, know well uh, has been something that's been really exciting to me. So I'm, I'm honored to be a part of this conversation. Um, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been tough for me, honestly, uh, these last few years. Um, you know, I've been coming into my own. I'm, I'm now raising kids of my own, trying to figure out how to, you know, how to, how to do that. Um, in some way, shape or form. Um, and I'm in this place in my life where I have been really holding up the things that, um, that I've been taught and, and trying to weigh them against my experience now in the last couple of decades. Um, and I have to say, you know, I've, I fell into a bit of a rut um, a couple of years ago. And, you know, it was this rut that had me looking at the world around us, um, my city here in Chicago, um, you know, our state here in the country and across the world really, um, and, and trying to ask myself, why is it always us? Why is it always black folks? Why is it, why are we always at the end of the, you know, the bottom of the totem pole? Why are we always at the, you know, the dire end of the statistic, whatever the statistic is? First people in jail, you know, longest incarceration, you know, uh, you know, mothers, you know, uh, you know, the first to die in terms of, you know, folks, uh, you know, accessing care. And it, it really, it had me down. Um, and as an organizer, someone who, who does work for ju social justice for a living, I, this is something that I really had to grapple with. I feel privileged to have been raised um, in a deeply religious environment and in an environment that really centered the divine that centered the creator. Um, but what I'm realizing as I get older is that that environment didn't necessarily center blackness as a mean to understand the divine. Um, and at one point in my life, I probably would have thought that that is unnecessary, that, that you know, why surely the divine is, you know, greater than uh, such petty things as race and identity. But since that time, um, I, I have felt privileged to find my way into spaces that do exactly that, that center Blackness as an avenue, as a means to understand the divine plan and our relationship to that. Um, and so I've been able to reconcile some things, and I'll share, um, you know, just the explanation that was at the core of that reconciliation for me a couple of years ago. Um, it's an explanation that comes to me probably third or fourth hand at this point, um, you know, from a... a, a uh, a black imam in uh, Atlanta to a brother-in-law of mine through a sister took another route and finally got to me. But it was something that really opened my eyes and allowed me to to place myself in this time. Um, and that is uh, the story of Moses. 
of, of Musa, peace be upon him. Um, and the fact that, you know, he and his people can suffer through the tyranny and the oppression of the pharaonic state. Um, and then they get free of that and then wander for 40 years, right? And, and he, the way that I, uh, I hear this or I heard this from those different routes was that, you know, the Imam says that, you know, in biblical times and in Quranic times and in language, you know, the 40 years is not, you know, the, the, the length of time is a lot longer than we may expect. And, you know, in the Quran, when it talks about 70 years, for instance, it could mean 70 years plus many, 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 many years. And so in this interpretation, he says that that 40 years may have been a lot more like 400 years. And, um, and we know that in this country, we're finally approaching those kind of 400 years. Um, we've been dealing with this pharaonic state, if you will, um, also known as, you know, chattel slavery, also known as uh, Jim Crow, also known as the prison industrial complex, as the carceral state, you know, for, for these hundreds of years. And perhaps we're finally finding our way, building our way towards the promised land. So. For me, you know, I, I, I don't believe that this, this, this earth project uh, is, you know, I don't, I don't believe it was launched in vain. Um, I do believe in a, in a divine plan and I believe in a merciful and just, you know, creator. And, um, and for me, it means that I need to play my part in that. Um, and me playing my part in that is being an organizer and making sure that I'm working to dismantle these systems of racism and, you know, injustice in any way that I can every day. Thank you so much, Alia. Uh, I'm going to turn to Dr. Butler. And Dr. Butler, yes. Unmuting. Good afternoon. Thank you, Reverend Davey. Uh, thank you, Leah. also. I'm really struck by what you said. And this has been a hard year. Let's, let's not lie about it. It's been really, really awful. And it wasn't just about George Floyd, although that really took center stage last summer. All of this happened in the middle of a, a global pandemic and lots of death and lots of destruction around us. And I want to personally say, first of all, that I think that many of us have tried to bury all of these feelings, the, the feelings of despair and disgust and disillusionment with this country. Um, as a historian, I've never been surprised about what America is. So I always know what it is and I know what I am dealing with. But I think this particular year has been about a battle and that battle has been between the America that we have and the America that always has been vis-a-vis -vis a way of thinking about America that is naive, misguided, and quite frankly, wrong. And I think that one of the things that really strikes me about this past year for me is how have I been trying to deal with it? I've, I've been trying to deal with it by writing because writing is my way of getting the word out to people and thinking about that. And so in the midst of the murders of George Floyd and um, the subsequent murders by police of so many people that I can't even begin to name a litany of in the last year, what I did and what I think my way of dealing with this is, is to write about the history, the history of racism in America, to call out the truths that we are living under. I think many times that we talk about faith and we don't want to talk about the negative aspects of faith. We don't want to talk about how faith supports the racial structures in America and how faith for some people is a way in which to enact their prejudices and their problems with uh, Black people. And I think that's a really important way to think about what has happened in this past year and what we're what we are struggling with. I also think that it's hard to hope in the midst of despair. But um, I recently wrote a piece for Faithfully magazine, and I just want to read a little bit of it, only because I think that it adds to the question that you've asked today. And I want to just say this: yet hope, as scriptures tells us in Romans five five, does not disappoint. Black people in America have collectively been among the most hopeful people in this nation. If you disagree, consider this. African Americans have still wanted to engage the American project despite the utter oppression of slavery, the relentless violence of racism, and the efforts to erase our humanity. And I think that's the most important thing right now is that uh, for us to even have this conversation today means that we have some hope. 
We have hope in the face of monumental issues about taking away voting rights. We have hope in the midst of, you know, the, uh, the carceral state. We have hope in the midst of economic problems. We have hope in the midst of black bodies being abused, whether that is on the streets of our nation or on the hospital rooms where our people could not get help when they had coronavirus. And in our communities where there is a lot of disinformation and despair about whether or not you should take a vaccine. And so I look at all of those things and I think about that this year. And I think that this is not just as Joe Biden says, a fight for the soul of America it is a fight for our own souls, a fight for our souls to be able to live in the midst of this. Um, kind of environment in which Black people are vilified, in which Black people are put down at the bottom, and that the hope is that we continue to have hope in ourselves and realize the value that we all have in the eyes of our Creator. And I think that is the important thing to, to take away whatever we talk about today is that despite the ways in which people don't want to talk about, you know, history or racism, or they want to continue to perpetuate the lies that have supported the white supremacist structure of this country, what we do need to remember that we are a people rise and continue to rise and continue to rise up against those who would continue to oppress us. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Uh, thank you for those insights. And we'll look forward to uh, discussing both your comments and Alia's comments uh, as, as we go on. I'm going to turn now to Reverend Taylor uh, to uh, see how you would like to respond to uh, the question. Well, firstly, I want to thank IFYC for the invitation. Congratulations to you, uh, Reverend Davey, for your new position. And thank you to all of the other panelists. I'm really grateful for what Dr. Butler and Leah just shared. I'm gonna kind of take it back to the verdict, the moment of the verdict of Derek Chavon. And I'll admit that like probably many out there, I had just a really anguished mix of emotions that day. On the one hand, I felt incredible relief that he was found guilty, and I know we're still waiting on the actual sen sen sentencing. I felt relief because I felt deep in my spirit that if it had not been a guilty verdict, I would not in any good conscience be able to explain to my two black sons that there is any hope of equal justice under the law anytime soon in this country. Same time, I was filled with a great deal of righteous anger and dread on that day. I felt righteous anger because I was not confident that there would be the same degree of accountability for the recent killings of, of Adam Toledo, Dante Wright, and the over 300 other people who have been killed by police violence in 2021 alone. I felt heartache for the murder, the killing of Makia Bryant, a 16-year-old girl who was killed just a day before the verdict took place. And as I think about the arc of history, you, you mentioned that Dr. King quote, I have been a kind of student of the civil rights movement for most of my life. And I often felt that I had been born in the wrong era, wished that I'd been born so that I could grow up in the height of the civil rights struggle. And I have to admit, on the one hand, I was very clear that my generation, Generation X and subsequent generations inherit the unfinished business of the civil rights struggle. I was a little bit naive that my generation would have to face a continued struggle around something as simple and as sacred as the right to vote. The 1965 Voting Rights Act was passed that cemented the right to vote to all Americans. I think it's important, as Dr. Butler kind of mentioned, to just honor the fact that Black Americans have been the most powerful democratizing force in American history. And that signature achievement of the civil rights movement, while you know, certainly there were some challenges to it, felt like it was something that would be permanent. And yet, over 50 years later, we find ourselves in the context of a moment in which that right is under assault, where the ugly head of white supremacy is trying to undermine that right in all kinds of both overt and covert ways. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but I really see that us right now at an inflection moment as a nation. There certainly have been others, but I feel like we're in one, one now, in part because of all that 
the COVID-19 crisis revealed the stark racial inequalities and injustices that we knew were already there, but I think are now made more known as a result of a pandemic. And then the other dual pandemic of systemic racism, which was also brought to light, not just by the murder of George Floyd, but also by the whole series of high profile killings that we saw over the course of this last summer that sparked a racial uprising and racial awakening. I've tried not to use the word re reckoning yet or as much in describing where we are, because I think reckoning assumes or presumes that there's been significant structural change, policies change as a result of the awakening that's happened. And I would argue that we are not close to being there yet. We are in this moment where we could e easily see either regress or progress. And that's only that has been the case throughout our history. I am somewhat hopeful and try to be very hopeful in my best days that we will see progress. But the fact that some just basic and overdue reforms in policing that are contained in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which is far from perfect, it's just a series of very necessary, but again, imperfect steps, is stuck in the hyper-partisanship of Congress right now. And while negotiations are happening to try to get a deal around what's called qualified immunity, it's clear that so much more needs to be done to not only make some necessary reforms to our broken and, and racialized policing system, but to tr fundamentally transform and reimagine what public safety looks like so that we can create a system that does not criminalize and dehumanize black and brown lives. I wanna just close at least this initial set of comments by focusing back on the fundamental right to vote. One of my heroes is Congressman John Lewis. We know that he went on to glory this, this, um, this past year. And he described voting as the most powerful nonviolent tool we have in a democracy. Sojourners has been working with the National African American Clergy Network in the last couple of election cycles to mobilize black clergy with other white allies and, and other allies of other faith traditions, actually. We were joined by many rabbis in this 2020 election cycle to try to raise awareness about the threat of voter suppression and to work tirelessly to push back against efforts to further restrict the right to vote. And we, we literally worked in nine states to try to hold election officials accountable for a free, fair, and safe election. We mobilized over 2,000 clergy to be poll chaplains to try to deter intimidation and violence from happening at the poll, at polling sites. We see one political party literally doubling down on the big lie that this last election was stolen. And they're using that lie as a pretense to literally potentially steal uh, the uh, you know series of election outcomes in 2022. And so I think you know one of the most critical things that we can do as an interfaith movement is to treat the right to vote as sacred and to treat it as something that we have to continually defend and we have to continue to fight for. And I'm hopeful that many of us will be working together to do just that in the next number of months and years. Thank you, Reverend Taylor. Uh, thank you for those uh, for those comments and, and analysis. And again, we'll look forward to uh, continuing the conversation. We'll now turn to uh, Dr. Williams to get his reflections uh, on the on the question on the table. Dr. Williams, thank you so much for um, this opportunity to be here with you. I'm delighted to be in such excellent company uh, today. And congratulations to you, Reverend Davy, on your new position and um, Thank you all for letting me be a part of this marvelous conversation. I'm watching the time, so I'm not going to be before you long. But in a word, um, uh, where, how, how do I feel about this moment where we are? I, I was thinking of a quote by uh, uh, the, the late uh, novelist, essayist, and film, uh, filmmaker Zora Hurston, who said that there are years that ask questions and years that answer. And I think that this last year has both uh, asked some serious questions and attempted to provide answers for a lot of the questions uh, that have been uh, lingering in the, the human spirit. Um, I, I think about these, um, you know, the, the, the competing pandemics of course, there's the pandemic of race, there's the pandemic of health, but then there's also a pandemic of violence. 
against um, black, brown, trans bodies. Um, and I was thinking about this violence and sometimes it's not even what uh, the violent things that, that, that actually happen to us, but it's to li the, the, the living in uh, a kind of fear, how, how, how black lives, um, brown lives are circumscribed by, by fear of what could happen. Uh, so there, there's also this, 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 uh, this pandemic of violence that promotes this kind of culture of fear. Um, the other day, um, interestingly, I was uh, riding with the clergy person uh, to a funeral. It was in Pittsburgh. We left Washington at four in the morning. We arrived at the church um, about 20 minutes before the, uh, a, a few minutes before the funeral uh, was to begin. And um, uh, the clergy person that I was with, he was fully dressed, but he didn't have on his collar. He said, uh, there's a little construction site over there. And do you think I can just, we could ride over there and, and you could help me get this collar on me? And I thought immediately about Ahmaud Arbery. I said, brother, I don't think that's going to be safe. Because, we, I mean, this fear is real because of the things that happen uh, in our world. But then also, there is also, I think, a pandemic of untruth. There's been so many uh, 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 lies. Uh, my mother didn't like us to say that word lie for whatever reason. That's a Southern thing, I guess. But there's been so many lies told you just don't know what's going on. Some lies you can tell, but some of them sound kind of kind of real, but it's creating a lot of problems. All of the lies that are being told. Um, I was thinking about the, um, the George Floyd case. Now, all of those, you know, there are the questions about how, what was the cause of death? Was it the exhaust fumes? Uh, was there something in his system? Uh, was it uh, COVID possibilities? What about those, those, those uh, uh, nine minutes? Um, so, so I think that this is, but, but I would also say that this is also an extremely, um, for many people, uh, a, a, a hopeful time just to see how many people were, um, I don't know if they were awakened or, or, or momentarily awakened by, um, by this visible display of, of injustice that played out um, and, and then the whole world saw it. So I think this is the best, this is the worst of times. Um, but I also think that um, that this is a, a, a moment where um, if we kind of seize this moment and, and try to awaken as many people as possible um, that, um, you know, maybe, just maybe we can, we can move the needle a little bit. And I, I'm the kind of person, I, I, I don't look anymore for victory in tidal waves, but flickers and flashes. We can get a few flickers. Uh, I think that we'll, um, we might be able to leave the world a, 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 a little, leave the world a, a little better than we found it. Great, thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, it, do any other panelists want to respond to any of uh, anything that's been raised before we before we move on to um, sort of another topic of of conversation? I, I would just like to put one thing out. I you know um, is take us a little bit far afield, but I'll, I'll bring us back. I um, in addition to the work that I've been doing at Union and now IFYC and, and uh, I serve as chair of the New York City's Police Oversight Board called the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Uh, we handled the uh, Daniel Pantaleo case who killed Eric Garner, the police officer who killed Eric Garner on Staten Island, uh, got a guilty verdict in administrative trial, got the commissioner to ultimately um, agree with us and the judge that Pantaleo should be fired. And then we get, you know, and so we hear a lot from law enforcement uh, about, and we're hearing it in the mayoral race in New York City, about all well and good to go after, and sometimes not all and good, officers. But what about what's going on places like New York now with young men, primarily men of color, but young people of color, engaging in violent acts upon each other. How are we to understand that? So I'll ask you as faith leaders, 
interfaith leaders. One, how do we respond when the detractors who want to divert us from the ways in which the state is using force to, in some cases, murder and injure people um, in the form of policing, but also to this reality that they point to of violence, particularly gun violence, particularly among young people, um, and more specifically in our urban areas, but beyond. So what do we think about them using that argument? And then two, what do we think about the circumstance now from a, from a faith, in a, in a faith perspective? And I'll reverse sort of a little bit. I'll start with Dr. Williams. You, you have any, any thoughts on that? And I was, I was forming my thoughts and then you called me. <laughs> okay. um, no, but I, I think that you raise um, a, 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 an interesting question. But one of the things I always like to think about um, is the, the system, the brokenness of the system. Um, when young black men or, or brown men use weapons against each other, uh, it becomes very clear that they, the, the full force of the law uh, will be um, meted against them. Uh, but there are some cases in our, in our world, uh, in some people, um, they commit crimes and they're um, almost above the law. And um, the guns are just, are just the problem. And I was telling a friend, he said, what can we do about these guns? I said, I, I don't know if they need to, you know, raise the cost of bullets uh, to make them not, uh, not affordable, but the, but the guns are, are a problem. We need to get rid of the guns um, somehow. Um, but yeah, I think that you raise a very, very, um, very interesting question. And I'm curious to see how my colleagues will respond to that. Okay. Well, I saw Dr. Butler unmuted almost immediately. So Dr. Butler, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I do. I have a lot of thoughts about this. First of all, um, you need to point out to your policemen friends, that I'm put friends in quotation marks, that the, the red herring about this is that there's a couple of things. One is the inability to deal with the structural racism and the structural economic inequalities that are in our communities. That's the first thing. I mean, I think that a lot of this has escalated um, in the pandemic period in part because we have people who don't have a regular income. In my own neighborhood in Philadelphia, we've seen an uptick in violence and carjackings and robberies and all these things. And I live in a pretty, you know, quiet, mixed race neighborhood. And that has really changed a lot. And so I'm thinking part of this is about what this particular time is and that the normal flows of commerce have been stopped. And it seems strange to link this to an economic piece, but I think it's really important. The second piece is that I've had some um, experience with this in my community, in part because of the kinds of things that the police have done in the communities, like about eight blocks from where I currently live. There was during um, sort of, you know, the kinds of times where people were tearing up stuff because of different things that had happened. Uh, they bought out tanks, they tear gas people's homes that didn't have anything to do with this. And so I want to put back the question to them and say, why must you come with so much firepower into our communities? And you're worried about the guns that we have when you come in with tanks. I mean, this, this is the inequality of all of this, right? So don't let people gas you. And I'm saying it just like this because I think it needs to be said. There is the gassing of us in our communities to talk about, well, why do you have the problems go? Why are you shooting everybody? When in fact, who is bringing in the guns? Who is making the laws to make guns get easier in the community? In my home state of Texas right now, you don't need a background check anymore. You don't have to go get a class to carry a gun. You don't have to, you can just go buy a gun from I believe 21 forward, it might even be as low as 18. So when we hear these things, you need to have the facts to push back on people about this because I get really annoyed and disgusted with the fact that everybody wants to blame this on the black community when the black community don't own Colt, they don't own Smith and Wesson, they don't own none of this stuff that everybody has been doing and we need to understand where this is coming from. And let me add this because I won't make everybody mad today. When we have white evangelicals who are talking about God, guns, and babies, and this is all they have to say about anything, 
And then they want to talk about law and order, which comes from the patty rollers in the 19th century controlling black folks. Then I ask you, what is the point? You see, I could not be on this commission that you want right now because I don't have no respect for this stuff. Uh, let me just be blunt, okay? Because we need to break it on down to where it is to the white meat, okay? Because it's happening to us. How are we supposed to deal with this when they are happy that we are shooting each other so they can come and kill us? That's my that's my question. Understood. Thank you for that response. Uh, um, uh, it obviously generates a lot of thoughts and comments, but I, I, Ali, any, any thoughts here? And then Adam will, Reverend Taylor will turn to you. I had some thoughts, but I don't need to say them anymore uh, because I think that they have been said uh, very, very well by Dr. Butler. Um, and the only thing that I would add is that, you know, I, yes, I, 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 would, I would concur. I try my hardest not to engage with detractors of that sort anymore for my own mental health. Um, but the short and simple of it is that the violence that we see in our streets is a violence of neglect, of of hopelessness, of absolute desperation. And you cannot equate that with what happens to us by the forces um, that you know we have to deal with every day. Um, and uh, as just it's just that's not an yeah. I'm with Dr. Butler on this in that I can't really, it's hard for me to have this conversation. It's hard for me to engage in this because I feel like it's an exception where we're it, the question itself is a question that is um, that is completely dismissing the humanity behind the people that are in question here. It is, is a, it is a question that is designed to, um, to create an exception where there shouldn't be one. We have lives and we deserve to live them, period, in peace, period, with justice, period. You know, and until that is understood, then I don't even know what the point of the conversation is on that front. Understood. Thank you, Dr. Reverend Taylor. No, I mean, I'm grateful for all that's been shared. I underscore Dr. Williams' point about gun control. I mean, it is absolutely insane that we have a complete impasse, mainly because of the GOP and the NRA around passing any kind of sensible, let alone comprehensive gun control. So I think that is a starting point or one of the key issues. The other is, kind of alluded to this, but I'll just say it directly is, you know, we have communities that have been disinvested from for decades. And many cities that spend a quarter, a third, some cases, almost half of their budgets on policing. And so the answer is not simply to try to solve every problem through policing, particularly when we know that it has been so racialized and has been responsible for so many senseless deaths. And so I think this kind of call to defund, as controversial as that sometimes can sound, is important. We have to interrogate the budgets that you know, utilize our taxpaying dollars and try to start investing a lot more in programs that are gonna help uplift, empower, support, and encourage our young people, uh, many of whom who are dealing with all kinds of very dire challenges um, that were described before. So I think, I think this kind of reinvest, I prefer the word reinvest, just because I think it's, it's probably gonna be more effective politically. But the bottom line is we, we really have to, to focus our energies there as well. Thank you. Um, just to shift gears slightly, um, and obviously we could, uh, we could talk about these uh, issues uh, for hours, but to think about the communities we all come from, uh, the ways in which we, uh, in our interfaith work, um, try to engage difference and bridge difference. Um, and I would ask, can you talk about um, sort of uh, uh, encounters of difference, particularly as it relates to faith and faith engagement uh, that you've had, and, and particularly to the, within the Black community itself, uh, and how that's had an impact or an effect on both how you see the world and how you respond uh, to, to, some of these, to some of these issues? And Reverend Taylor, let's start, let's start with you. Yeah, that's a great question. So the most recent example that's given me a lot of hope is an initiative that Sojourners and many other organizations have been kind of co-laboring around called Face for Vaccines. It is a, and actually IFYC has also been engaged in it. It, it basically started a couple months ago 
when a number of faith leaders, including uh, Dr. Muhammad El Sanusi, you know, recognized that faith communities could be the real game changer in the context of addressing the COVID pandemic, both in the context of trying to ensure that houses of worship could be uh, places where people could get the vaccine as the vaccines were starting to become more available, and as a way to try to convince people, persuade them to get the vaccine, both to protect themselves for their own health, but also to protect others, kind of as a, at least in the Christian tradition, a core commitment to the golden rule. And so, you know, a number of different organizations, including the National Council of Churches and some uh, the Muslim Health Association and so many others came together in order to form this coalition, in order to engage with the Biden administration, but also with local and state health authorities to really try to make this case and get them to make it easier for houses of worship to become vaccination sites. That's also just critical because people at a community level still tend to trust their religious leaders. While, you know, there's certainly significant challenges <laughs> with, you know, our, our religious institutions, they still enjoy a great deal of trust. And so they could be some of the most important and accessible places where people could get the vaccine. And fortunately, we've seen quite a bit of progress and traction in enabling that to happen. We're now really working together to try to support President Biden's push over the next month to try to get 70% of, over 70% of American adults vaccinated. And I think, you know, as uh, Dr. Ibu Patel and others would say, the last mile in this is really gonna come down to personal relationships, literally people engaging with people in their social networks in order to get them accurate information and to have real conversations with them to try to walk them through why getting the vaccine can be such a moral imperative, but also I would say it's an important imperative for the common good. Thank you. Alia, bridging uh, difference, particularly in the interfaith context to address some of these issues, thoughts on this? Yeah. Well, you know, um, what I would say is we're coming up on the 55th anniversary um, of Dr. King's march into Marquette Park here in Chicago uh, in August this year. And, you know, a, a few years ago, five years ago, in fact, Iman led a, um, you know, initiative to create the first permanent um, living memorial, as we call it, to, to that moment, to Dr. King's, the Chicago Freedom Movement in Marquette Park. Um, and really bring together a lot of these communities that even from 50 years ago have not really reconciled uh, that day. And, and you know, we remember that that occasion uh, 50 years ago, 55 years ago as, as the one when Dr. King and 700 other marchers, they march into Market Park and they're confronted by, uh, you know, this mob of 5,000, you know, men, women, children, elderly wielding rocks and stones and bottles. This is the place where Dr. King would get stoned in the head and fall to the ground and that, you know, that really epic picture of him. Um, and he would go on to say that, uh, you know, that, that uh, though he'd faced the racism of the South, that he'd never seen mobs as hostile or as hate-filled as he had here in Chicago uh, on that day. And, and further, that if he had the chance to do it again, which is what one of the reporters asked, that of course he would because it was important to bring the evil out of darkness and into the light. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the kind of intersection here for me is, you know, in the commemoration of this, of this occasion, you know, uh, five years ago, uh, the, the event that we put on and the memorial that we, that we built, um, you know, this year actually we, we lost a giant um, in, in uh, uh, Rabbi Robert Marks, um, who's the, the founder um, uh, of JCUA, the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs. He's been a He'd been a you know mentor for many of us um, at Iman and and um, many folks in the in the Chicagoland area, um, and the the thing that I take from this you know is is actually something that we placed on the memorial, um, and that was that you know 55 years ago he wrote this letter for us this this epic letter because it it forms so much of the basis for how we both um, how we both agitate folks in our communities and outside of our communities. Uh, and he wrote this letter to the Chicago Board of Rabbis, um, you know, telling them that he uh, intended to be with the marchers um, on that day in Marquette Park with Dr. King, that before that he'd attended a march as a silent observer, but that his faith, his Jewish faith would not allow him to be on the side of 
uh, of those who were simply observing. His Jewish, uh, Jewish faith mandated that he be with the marchers, be with those who were demanding justice. And that's something that for me, um, I just, I think I, I look at today and I, I'm grateful for the fact that I feel like there are people that are doing that kind of thing these days. Uh, and they're doing that kind of thing for issues that are not just, you know, stereotypically their issues. Um, that we see, you know, our faith communities, um, you know, responding in ways that I think are just, um, are, are a little different than at least I've experienced in the last, you know, uh, 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 several years um, in this moment. And I think everyone is responding in this moment, of course, uh, but I think there's a unique, unique opportunity for our faith communities to do so in a way that, that is, um, that's really resonant with our particular, you know, uh, um, uh, expression of our faiths. Um, but that ends in something that is meaningful and that will actually drive change in our neighborhoods. So that, that story really stands out to me. Wonderful. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you. Um, Eric, do you want to uh, uh, come in here? And then we'll go to Dr. Butler. And I think you're on mute, Eric. Dr. Williams, sorry. Uh, uh, just briefly, um, I think that, that, that one um, way in which in my work at the museum that I try to create space and to bridge these divides, it's through, it's through programming. And uh, often the programming um, uh, and, and, and even these kinds of museums and these kind of cultural spaces that there are certain dominant uh, traditions uh, that, that their voices are always lifted up, uh, but to create space so others can hear about um, how people from traditions that they find so different, um, how they understand uh, 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 freedom, how they understand uh, 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 issue, uh, issues around morality and those kinds of issues. And one, one of the programs that I'm working on now is a, a, a Black Unbelief, which is a program where um, we bring, uh, we allow the voices of, of um, atheists, humanists, um, and uh, Black free thinkers um, to, um, to share their experiences. So much of the work at our museum is you know, predominantly Christian, really, um, because that's how the collecting went and everything, but tr try, trying, to, trying to create space. And then of course, this God Talk initiative that we have on millennial uh, disaffiliation with religion and allowing these voices that don't always have an opportunity to, to speak, uh, to give them an opportunity to testify, as we say in my tradition. Thank you. Dr. Butler? Yeah, I'll, I'll just briefly talk about a couple of things. Um, this year has been a little different for me because in addition to my writing and teaching, I had a chance to do a talk back in November about the history of Blacks and Jews with the Cat Center at the University of Pennsylvania. And that opened up a whole kind of other world of me giving talks and strategies about how can we improve relationships between the African-American and the Jewish community in the country. So that's one. The second one I, I wanna just tag on to what um, Eric has said is that it's really, really very important for us to be talking to people in the communities. And I know this is like an interfaith, but I think we need to uh, be cognizant of the fact that there are people who um, are agnostic, who are atheists, who are nuns, who are within our communities, both African-American and beyond, who are you know, disillusioned with faith for a variety of reasons. And but yet and still want to work with people of faith. And that is part of the work that I've been doing. I did a talk for Black Atheists in Atlanta last um, summer. And I'm hoping to do more of that work because I think, you know, especially as a religious studies scholar, for me, it's really important to reach across all lines of faith and to try to engage people in this conversation and the bigger work of justice that we have to do in this country. That's great. Thank you so much. And it is really important for us to um, uh, do just as you said, to remember that in this diverse community, black community of faith, there are people uh, who choose to have no faith as we understand it, or choose to be agnostic or humanist. And I'm, I'm uh, pleased that um, uh, humanism is a part of this uh, black interfaith initiative that we have uh, here at, at IFYC. I'm gonna turn now as I see the clock uh, approaching the top of the hour to ask the staff at uh, IFYC uh, who have been monitoring 
the question and answer box. Uh, if there are a few questions that uh, they like to pull out uh, and uh, have our panelists uh, reflect on. Um, Becca or Catherine? Yes, thank you. There's a lot of gratitude and expressions of um, being moved by this important conversation. And an interesting question just about language, what, how people understand or are careful about um, and using language that is both accurate and invitational. So the example here is from Harriet Dart, um, gun safety instead of gun control, community investment instead of defund the police. Just a comment of affirmation on that. So that really stood out to me. Dr. Butler, any thoughts? Yeah, I think it's incumbent upon us to do two things is that everybody has different languages in which they speak. Um, I have a lot of friends who want to say defund the police, and I'm not mad at them because I understand exactly where that's coming from. And I think part of the questions about language is that you have to know what the language means and you have to understand what the questions are. I do agree that there are conversations in which you might need to change that language in order to get people on board. But I think the other part is to understand that while we are buying tanks or uh, what was the, the latest thing I just saw in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, where they're spending millions of dollars on three police helicopters, as opposed to fixing schools and doing everything else, I think we need to understand that when people say defund the police, they say it for a particular kind of reason. They say it because of stupid stuff like this. And I lived in Nashville. Nobody needs three police helicopters to go over the city of Nashville. You barely need one. OK, I know it's gotten bigger, but you barely need one. And, um, you know, I think it's really important while, you know, it's it, it's. It is a natural thing to want to police language. It's like this. If you can't police custom, you can't police language. You need to make sure you understand what people are talking about. And if you get into a conversation in which you need to think about how you talk to people who are recalcitrant on gun control or defunding the police, then I encourage you to use that language where you can. And some of us going to keep using the language that we use. Thank you. Aliyah. I don't have anything to add to that. Thank you. Okay. Reverend Taylor. Yeah, I would just add a kind of additional frame. And I'm saying this in part because I've been thinking a lot about this and writing a lot about it in this forthcoming book, that the full title is A More Perfect Union, A New Vision for Building the Beloved Community. And I chose this focus on the beloved community very intentionally, in part because it was a a moral vision that animated the civil rights movement, not just by Dr. King, but other key leaders like Ella Baker and Van Lu Hamer and, and others. And because I really feel like part of what we need is more inclusive and invitational language that tells a new narrative for this nation. And in some ways it's not new because certainly civil rights leaders and others have been telling a different story of America for a very long time. But I feel like we need to recast and reimagine what that looks like in our current moment. And one of the things that I find so powerful about the beloved community is it's a moral vision that I think could unite the majority of Americans across many of the political, ideological, and even racial divisions that we see. And I'm not naive that like every single American is gonna jump on that bandwagon per se, but I do think it is one that enable, it creates space for people who are very secular and humanist, for people who are deeply religious, talk about the ways in which there's so many ways that other faith traditions also have their own way of describing the beloved community. And at its best, it is a nation, a country, a even world where everyone is seen, is respected, is valued, and everyone can thrive, and of course has their fundamental rights uh, res uh, respected as well. So anyway, I, I just wanna offer that up as kind of a invitational frame that I hope can offer some, some hope for the future. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I'm sorry. No, um, I won't add anything to this. Thank you. Thank you. So we're, uh, we're, we're four minutes before the top of the hour. Maybe um, a way to end is a little bit of the way we started. And Dr. Butler, you raised the, the issue of hope uh, in your uh, initial uh, comments about uh, how Black people uh, in our very struggles uh, have been sort of, uh, ex it, it may be the quintessential or the, we've epitomized uh, examples of hope uh, in the midst of some of the most horrendous uh, struggles that any uh, communities of humanity 
uh, have faith. So in the inner faith context, uh, can you give us, uh, and I'm, I'll ask each of you to do this, what, what would be a word of hope? What would you um, uh, uh, posit that we should uh, as, aspire to or be inspired by uh, uh, in, in, in this era as it, as it unfolds before us? I'm going to say we should aspire, and this is going to sound like a very crazy thing to say, we should aspire to be as together as our detractors are. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because right now it is very clear to me that, you know, I'm just laid out here, Republicans, conservative Christians, and, and others are very much on their program, and they are on their program 24-7. The problem for us is how do we come together to work together to get some of the things that we need to get done in our communities done and to stop the tide of violence, whether that be police violence or violence in our communities, or to stop the kinds of things that are happening with coronavirus and to make sure that we get our communities vaccinated, to make sure that our faith communities don't die out because of the economic and social situations that they are. We need to take a page from the conservatives. They are on their game 24 seven, 365 days a week, however many seconds there are in a year. And if we could achieve that same kind of determination, there is not anything that we cannot do. So my hope is that we will take a page from this in the face of mounting and, and very serious opposition to go forward this year and to go forward into 2022 to try to make sure that we don't lose the gains that our forefathers and foremothers have made for us in this country. Thank you. Alia. Uh, so I, I sometimes claim my status as a millennial to explain why I uh, often feel very jaded and um, and a little skeptical about, uh, you know, just what it takes to make real change happen, and and if change is really happen, uh, you know, possible. Uh, as an organizer, I know that I I need to live with one foot in the world as it is, and one, foot, you know, in the in the world as it could be. Um, today, I feel some cautious optimism about the fact that we are clearly being loud enough and at, at, at this point in some ways resident enough um, to when it comes to issues of equity, uh, you know, at least. Um, I think that there is, you know, there's certainly, there are local governments now, there are, you know, major corporations, there are institutions that are realizing that the old status quo, that the, um, you know, the, that the, the old diversity platitudes, if you will, are no longer going to work. Um, uh, you know, in general, I, I, um, I find cancel culture to be very problematic in many ways, but I can be totally down uh, for it when it means that we can put the fear of God in some of these major corporations, especially those that have been sucking the, you know, the, the blood and the life out of, you know, black and brown communities for decades. Um, and so I see hope in that, honestly. Um, and, you know, I'll say that something else that, that, that is giving me hope is that people beyond just the regular old, you know, organizers, activists, uh, academics that have been maybe preaching this for years, um, I think people are finally starting to connect issues in ways that they haven't before. And for me, as someone that has, you know, been very local, hyper-local in Chicago, doing this community organizing work for the last 12 years, um, but also has a very global outlook, uh, that is something to me that is that is really interesting. And I want to be honest in saying that, you know, something that makes deliberately interfaith circles sometimes difficult, I, I know at least for people like me, um, is that I, I feel there's a tendency sometimes to stay on some of those safe subjects uh, and to really kind of dance at the periphery of some of the subjects that are not as safe. So I'll say that something else that gives me hope is the fact that more people are beginning to connect issues of racial justice and inequality in this country to what's happening across the world, uh, in places like Colombia, in places like um, you know uh, British Columbia, where they just you know found the, the bodies of these 215 uh, you know indigenous children um, that were just you know clearly killed in these assimilation schools, but also in places like Palestine and Israel. 
And I know that any time that Palestine and Israel are brought into an interfaith circle, an interfaith conversation, there's a palpable change that happens in the room and it's probably happening right now. Um, but I don't think that our interfaith conversations are going to mean much if we can't use them to address injustice wherever we find it, whether that is on the south side of Chicago or the east side of Jerusalem. And my hope and my prayer is that people are beginning to connect those issues and see those as their struggles, just as the struggles that we know we have been facing in this country for years have been our struggles. That is the hope that I see, and that's my prayer for, for how we move forward. So given the lateness of the hour, uh, uh, Dr. Williams and uh, Dr. Taylor, Reverend Taylor, I am going to uh, leave it with uh, the last word that we got from Alia. Uh, I would ask you to uh, share your thoughts, maybe, uh, if you would, with us in writing. We'll ship it out to uh, all of the people who've joined us here today. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to thank all of you. You give me hope uh, in the work that you do. Um, I, I, I have hope in this, uh, this Black Interfaith Initiative. Uh, hope in the work that places like IFYC and Union Theological Seminary and Sojourners and the, the, the uh, African American Museum in DC and others do around the country and around the world. Um, and uh, an hour is never enough for these conversations, but hopefully it's, it's leaven, it's some yeast that will, that will yield greater and bigger and more promising results in the months and years ahead of us. So thanks to all of you. Thanks FYC, thanks IBU, uh, IFYC staff. Thanks to all of those people who joined uh, us here today. Uh, and we'll look forward to continuing these conversations in the, in the days uh, ahead of us. Uh, everyone take care uh, and have a great afternoon.